think I can do it now. You cannot share screen, okay. Wait, 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 I'm, uh, okay. Sorry, I think it was my fault. Let's see. So that means, uh, Enrico, probably you are supposed to be, ah, yeah, great. Good. Um, okay, yeah, it seems to work, right? Everyone can see it. Okay, and here, great, Enrico, so uh, you, you have 30 minutes. I'll give you a warning at 25, is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, would you prefer to take questions at the end of your talk? Uh, no, no, that, definitely during the talk. I, I can see that uh, the participants need no encouragement to ask questions, and I've seen some really interesting discussion going on. But yes. nevertheless, please keep asking. It's going to be much more interesting for everyone if you interrupt okay. me and okay. ask questions. And, and just to the audience, Enrico is not going to be around during discussion, so uh, probably a good idea uh, to ask your questions during the talk or uh but we'll try to make sure that it doesn't go uh into a lorenz uh, dilated tree water anyway um so take it away enrico so enrico is going to yeah. tell us about the timeless history of time thank you very much thank, thanks a lot for the for the opportunity for the invitation actually i apologize for not being available at the discussion session but it's so hard to get a, a, a COVID booster shot and i managed to get an appointment and i really cannot miss miss that so things are getting a bit dire around here and also i wanted to apologize for uh um, for for not being um at my talk uh, yesterday um I, I would like to thank the organizers and, and and the participants for putting together this very nice meeting um so the idea what i wanted to talk about is some recent progress mostly in understanding um quantum field theory in in the sitter and, and try to put it into the perspective that is perhaps more interesting to the participants of this uh, of this meeting so i'm going to start uh, right away with some motivation and connection and you can approach this topic from from various points of view from one point of view is is coming from cosmology and the idea that we would like to understand the very early universe and inflations because we get to measure those uh, quantum correlators in cosmological surveys and that is probably the way that i was approaching this but there is another angle uh, which is perhaps more relevant to to the to the string to the indian string meeting which is um quantum understanding quantum field theory in perturbation theory in the sitter space is definitely a small corner uh, in which we can understand how things work in the sitter and maybe we can hope from that corner to try to understand uh, much uh, more challenging questions uh, such as the one that i'm trying to, to list uh, below for example uh, although the rest of the talk will be exclusively about quantum field theory and in perturbation theory in the sitter my hope is that eventually this will connect to things such as uh, uh, the search for um, the sitter solution in string theory, and perhaps the way that this connection might happen one day, very, very optimistically, which is related to Joao's talk, is that if we understand uh, uh, correlators in the sitter as, as well as we do amplitudes, or perhaps better even, uh, then we can eventually start to use those constraints to prove the UB regime of those correlators, and eventually we will see some constraints uh, arising for uh, potential UV completions of this theory. So there should be a connection uh, to, the, to the quest of finding the sitter solution in string theory. Um, another connection is to try to understand, we, we have heard some, some discussions about uh, positivity bounds and in, in flat space, and these are really interesting ways that we have to, to cut out theories that do admit uh, a consistent UV completion. Uh, since our universe eventually is an expanding one, and it looks like the metric is pretty close to the sitter. We would like to know which theories are consistent in the sitter rather than in Minkowski. And if the classes of theories that are consistent in the sitter, we already know is different from those that are consistent in Minkowski. So we would like to really know uh, which one are consistent in our universe. And for that, we need to develop different type of positivity bounds. We cannot just rely on the flat space ones for applications to, to the whole of of the universe. And eventually, I think that hopefully some of these results will one day give us some um, organizing principle or some constraints in thinking about a holographic approach to the sitter. 
during this talk, I will not really make a lot of progress on any of these directions, but that's that's where the, the long-term applications of, of this result, I, I hope, will be. Um, so let me uh, kind of focus on, on the observable. Actually, uh, a lot of the spirit is similar to the, the discussion that we have had with uh, the George just presented, in which you start thinking about observable in the given system you've chosen and try to put constraints on those. So the word bootstrap could be could be used for this type of um, uh, of approach. So the system that I want to consider is uh, the sitter space. Um, and in particular, for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on the Poincaré patch um, for various reasons. One is that that is the one that is usually relevant for, um, for cosmology. And so if we want to bridge the gap to make some relevant um, statement about observations, this, this is the relevant one. Uh, so the Poincaré patch only covers half of the sitter space. Um, let me see, yes. And so this is the infinite past, this green line. And I will always assume that in the infinite past, I choose some vacuum, which is called the bunch of Davis vacuum, which corresponds to assuming that on short scales, the vacuum is the same as the vacuum in Minkowski. Uh, a more formal definition, but which is equivalent is that this is the Euclidean hartle hawkin vacuum on the uh, global decitter. And the, game, the name of the game is assuming a vacuum and assuming some theories, understanding what is uh, the state at the end or towards in the asymptotic future of this phase of the sitter expansion. So if we, uh, we assume quantum mechanics, the, the universe is described by um, a wave function of the universe that I'll call psi. And what I will try to do is describe what is the wave function of the universe in the asymptotic future, which is this future uh, conformal boundary that we have here of the sitter. Okay, so in perturbation theory, I can always parameterize the most generic wave function that depends on any fields. These fields can be scalars, can be gravitons, can be gauge fields, you name it. I just call them five for simplicity of notation as an exponential of an ever a sum over an ever growing number of fields with coefficients. When I specify all of those coefficients, order by order, I have specified all the wave function in perturbation theory. So my whole talk will, will be about what do we know and what can we say about this wave function coefficient. And to some extent, if you want to have a flat space analogy, those wave function coefficient is like the amplitudes. Okay, as n grows, I'm looking at amplitudes with more and more external particles, and I would like to know uh, how general principles con constrain those, those objects. Strictly speaking, the wave function itself is not an observable, but from the wave function, I can compute observable with the usual quantum mechanics rules that expectation value of an operator is then integral uh, over the wave function with the operator in the middle. And we have a generic uh, prescription on how to compute the wave function in a generic system. We can always write it, uh, sorry, as a, um, as a path integral from some vacuum, e to the i is weighted by the, the action of the theory to some final, final uh, condition on the boundary. So if you give me a theory, uh, some Lagrangian S, I can compute this at least in perturbation theory. Um, just to say a word, uh, typically a lot of people thinking about uh, the sitter, but perhaps also anti the sitter, you might when I think about correlators, correlators are closely related to this wave function. In fact, in perturbation theory, you can always go from two point correlators, three points correlators, et cetera, to the coefficients appearing in this wave function. Quadratic coefficient, cubic coefficient, quartic coefficient, and so on. For this talk, and I will use the language of the wave function coefficient, but everything can be rephrased in terms of correlators. Um, so just like uh, in, um, in flat space, when we compute amplitudes, we have some uh, straightforward uh, rules in perturbation theory to compute any um, wave function coefficient to any order. And the rules are pretty similar to, to Feynman diagrams or feynman witten diagrams, because uh, uh, they were similarly developed uh, by, by Witten for the ADS, uh, for the equivalent ADS problem. 
And the idea is that you write a genetic diagram, you see the, the, the legs that make it to the asymptotic uh, future boundary are the external fields. For each one of those, you put a propagator that goes from the bulk to the boundary. And for every internal uh, line, you put a bulk to bulk propagator, which I call G. And for every vertex, you have to integrate over the whole of space time and put whatever interaction happens there. Um, here already see, you see kind of one of the first characteristics of what happens in the sitter, which um, when we compute amplitude, this is just, a, okay, so it, 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 at loop order, we, we are used to the idea that we have loops, but that, that we have uh, loop integrals. But here we will find a bunch of integrals already at three level. And the reason is that in the sitter, we don't have a globally defined time-like killing vector. So there is no time translations. And so these time integrals are not done automatically for us by energy conservation. We will have to, to keep them around. And that's what uh, complicates a lot of the analysis, even in perturbation theory. So even at three levels, things are much more complicated than they are uh, in flat space. Um, so the idea is going to be to, to say as much as we can about these objects, but without computing them directly in a, in a specific theory. Uh, so again, using uh, general principles, such as symmetries, unitarity, and locality to constrain these objects. And so let me start with, with symmetries. Um, and so... So that the motivation here is that this eventually is going to have some application to our universe, and therefore it is reasonable to, to work our way up in terms of adding symmetries from what we actually observe in our universe. We observe our universe to be homogene homogeneous and isotropic. So that means the, the isometries of three-dimensional Euclidean space. So three translations and three rotations. But we also observe the primordial perturbation to be scale invariance. And that's the strongest motivation that we have to think that there was some kind of phase of the sitter-like expansion in the early universe. So it is reasonable to assume translations, rotations, and scale invariance, which is implemented by some dilation operator. But the question is whether we should assume something more. So if we were in exact the sitter, then there would be additional symmetries given by the, the sitter boost, which is just the, the sitter generalization of, of, of Lorentz boost in, in Minkowski. Um, assuming the symmetries is extremely powerful and extremely constraining. And in fact, we know that well from the study of conformal field theory, the symmetries on the future boundary of the sitter become special conformal transformations. And then we can use the extremely powerful machinery of uh, conformal field theory to, to say, things about observable. And this has been uh, beautifully developed over the years, uh, going all the way back to Maldacena, Pimentel, Arkan Yamed, and most recently Bauman and Joyce have done uh, a lot of work in this direction. Um, however, uh, we are pretty much, for reasons that I will explain, you could also decide not to assume any invariance under the sitter boost or special conformal transformation. And there are a few reasons to do that. One is that we have never observed those symmetries in, in our universe. We have no, no reason to believe that they are actually applied. And the second reason is that they might be too constraining and they might pretty much rule out all models that uh, um, we are actually interested in. The reason is that even though our universe is approximated by the sitter, it cannot be exactly the sitter because otherwise it wouldn't have a history. The sitter is maximally symmetric, so every point is equal to every other. Um, and the breaking of this, the sitter isometries uh, can be arbitrarily large in terms of boosts. So I would never assume anything about the sitter boost, but uh, derive more general results. If you want, you can specify to the, the sitter limit and conform a field theory limit on the boundary but uh, most of the results will not rely on, on that assumption. Enrico? Yes. I have a small question about your previous slide. When you draw the diagrams. Yeah, so here, uh, let's say I'm uh, uh, working in some flat space approximation here, one of the vertices. Uh, I guess I'm not requiring momentum conservation even in this flat space patch. So how should I think about this diagram? These are not to be thought of as some on-shell matrices or anything like that, right? So what are they exactly? 
Uh, yeah, so here there will be momentum, special momentum conservation at traffic vertex. Sorry, I have a lot of feedback. There will be special momentum conservation at every vertex. And in fact, as I said before, that every vertex can, should be integrated over the whole of space time, but the integral in space, it's automatically done by special momentum conservation, but the integral in space, but the one in time uh, cannot be captured by conservation of energy. Uh, I will show you that in the limit in which all of these interactions happens in the infinite past, you can think of energy as being approximately conserved because the expansion of the universe is very slow with respect to the physical process. And in that limit, this will become a scattering amplitude times a, a factor that I will write down. So you should think of this as being um, literally a scattering amplitude in flat space, but with additional insertion of energy at every vertex. So you can go to a limit where you take away that insertion of energy and it's just an amplitude in flat space. But what actually the sitter does is that every time particles interact, they could also get some energy from the, the sitter background. And so that amplitude gets corrections that do not conserve energy. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll write down an explicit formula to prove that this equation in a certain limit is just a flat space amplitude. Hi, Enrico. This yes. is Mandeep here. You, you must go on, but I find it a little strange that you're uh, sing, you're not uh, using any of the special conformal symmetries. And the reason I say this is uh, when we did uh, some of the work uh, on imposing the consequences of symmetries, uh, what we had shown was that even when you include the breaking of uh, the de Sitter symmetries due to slow roll and so on. Uh, the breaking vis-a-vis -vis the special conformal transformations is no more or less important than the scale invariance. And in fact, the special conformal transformations buy you a great deal, as you know, in the work we've done. So I'm a little surprised that you choose not to use those symmetries at all. Yes, yeah. Excellent question. In fact, I was about to say that. Uh, uh, you, Sandeep, and, and Subrat Raju had some very nice paper around 2012, 2014. And I think at the time, I just was not aware about these techniques that came from ADS-CFT. It took me seven years to, to understand them, and now I'm slowly catching up. And I can see kind of the, the useful uh, uh, new ideas that you brought into the field. And, and I can tell you what are my thoughts, that if you study <clears throat> the simplest theories, for example, pure gravity or a, a canonical scalar field, then mm -hmm. it's true that uh, there is a single parameter that controls both the breaking of uh, dilations and the breaking, the breaking of boost or special conformal transformation. They are just fixed by the same parameters because the theory is particularly simple. Mm -hmm. More generally, in more general theories, for example, theories like P of X theories, that have a general function of the kinetic term, mm -hmm. very simple single derivative per field. In those theories, these two breakings are two completely different parameters. The breaking of uh, dilations is given by slow roll parameters, deviation from the Sitter expansion, mm -hmm. while the breaking of boost or special conformal transformation is given, for example, by the speed of sound of perturbation, which right. can be arbitrarily different from one. Right. So in those limits, uh, special conformal transformation are just not a good approximation. And in fact, we know that all the models that actually predict some correlation, which is what we're trying to compute here, they precisely badly break boost while they approximately respect uh, dilations. Yeah. There is some deeper reason why this is possible, which has to do with some kind of Coleman Mandula theorem for, for CFTs, but maybe I'll, I'll mention that later. But I think that's the motivation. And in the theories that you were studying, indeed, the breaking was controlled because it was pure gravity or conformal canonical couple scalar. But in more general theories, those two breakings are different. Yeah. But nevertheless, and you must go on, of course. You know, it, it's worth studying the case where the conformal breaking effects are of the order of the scale invariance. Because even though you're right, observationally, you can enhance the signals in the other case, like you mentioned, it's an obs in, in the long run, it becomes an observational question. Because if you can measure the perturbations to the required accuracy, nature will decide, you know, which of the two scenarios is right. So it's worth keeping both in mind and not discarding them. 
the, the ones yes, that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I don't think the other, exactly. Keeping those symmetry should definitely be in, in, on high on our minds because it's such a powerful constraint as, as you have shown as well. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll maybe try to frame this discussion in a more concrete uh, uh, form in, in, this, in this following slide. So uh, last year we proved uh, the, the set of theorems and perhaps the most important one for this discussion is theorem two. We proved that if the, on, if the only thing you care about are curvature perturbations coming from a, a deceptive phase mm -hmm. and you are in single field and you assume full deceptive symmetries, then all the correlators are the correlators of a free theory, meaning all connected correlators are zero. So this tells me that as somehow related to what you just said, that to get some non-trivial correlators, you need to break those symmetries a little bit. And the size of those correlators is related to the breaking of those symmetries. Um, and so for the conceivable future, because of the finite resolution of experiments, we will only see that breaking if that breaking is large and much larger than slural. And which is why I'm, I'm interested for the phenomenological reason to, to break it by a large amount. Okay. Uh, so I think th th this kind of theorem that makes it very precise. If you keep those symmetries, then as, at most you will be slow suppressed. Uh, if you don't, you can be much larger. Uh, but you're right that that's an extremely interesting limit. And in fact, pure gravity should probably be the first theory that we understand. And that theory does obey the, the scaling that, that you described. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's an excellent point. So I don't want to be critical about using those symmetries. It's just, uh, there is, uh, we were able to derive some results that do not rely on that, so mm -hmm. why not? Uh, and so because of, of this theorem, the, most of the results, especially about unitarity that I'll discuss uh, later on, will, be, will not assume this. So will be valid in any FLRW universe. So let me quickly discuss some notion of locality. Um, so there should be some, some notion of what does it mean that in the bulk of, of the sitter uh, interactions happen local and, and, and similar questions can be asked on the ADS side and they have some nice interpretation in terms of, uh, of, of boundary observables. Uh, this interpretation is still uh, to a large extent unclear in the sitter what it means to have a local interactions in the bulk. But one constraint that we were recently able to, to derive in a specific and the specific assumption is the following. Uh, so imagine that you only have a scalar, a scalar or spin two particles such as a, you know, an inflaton or a graviton and pure gravity would be a case. Um, and that's um, assumed that the theory only includes uh, um, interactions of, of fields at the same space time points and their derivatives, but not interactions that uh, um, involve inverse Laplacians, for example. Then under these two assumptions, the boundary wave function coefficient, which as I argue are related to observable, need to obey this very simple relation, which means that they cannot have a linear term when expanded in any of the norm of the external vectors. So if this K are the, the momenta of the external particles, they have some norm, which I call K without the bold face. And when you tailor expand in, in, in this k external, the linear term, the d in the k at k equals zero, has to vanish. If it doesn't, the theory is not local in this sense. So this is very useful, and this does apply, for example, to pure gravity. Uh, and in fact, in any um, even number of space-time dimensions. So it's a very useful constraint. If you write something, you can automatically eliminate a lot of uh, uh, terms that don't obey this because they couldn't possibly come up. Uh, and in, in real space, this is really has to do with how fast uh, spatial correlations are allowed to grow. Although here we, we write down the constraint in Fourier space. So can, can I ask one, one, one question? Uh, yes. Is there a, uh, the, this locality principle that you sort that can be, uh, you know, translated to the correlation functions also, right? And uh, is there a, a like CFT understanding, pure CFT understanding of this condition? Um, yeah, I would love to have it. And I spend a little bit of time in understanding it, but I still need to learn so much more than, than what, I, what I actually know. My understanding is that if you take, if you write this in terms, if you interpret this as a, as a CFT correlators on the boundary and you Fourier transform it to real space, uh, you would imagine that the locality has to do with cluster decomposition on how quickly this correlator factorizes into the product of two correlators. 
Uh, and how quickly that can happen is dictated by the two point function. And so this constraint ensures that a correlator of a bunch of operators as you physically separate them in real space becomes the product plus corrections. And those corrections need to go to zero at least as fast as the two point function. So this is the interpretation of, of this bound if you were to Fourier transform it. But uh, I would love to understand this better and have uh, a, a clearer picture. The main obstacle here is that a lot of concepts of locality and analysis in CFTs are done in real space, while all of this understanding that we have in the bulk is Fourier space and is a pain to go back and forth unless you have full conformal symmetry that fixes the answer. Okay. And I'd love to discuss uh, with you and both about this and about CFT, odd, parity odd CFT correlator. Um, thanks for the question. That's, that's a very good question. Um, very good. I, I, I should stress that this, this uh, constraint comes from manifest locality. So if you have cases in which you have inverse Laplacians, uh, then it doesn't apply. The theory might still be local. So this is a sufficient condition to be local, but it's not necessary. It could be that secretly you can get rid of these inverse Laplacians by rewriting the theory with some constraint fields that have local interactions. So this is a necessary but not sufficient condition for locality. Okay, that's just uh, the best we could do so far. Uh, this was there was a question earlier on, and this goes back to a paper by by Raju and Maldacena Pimentel some some ten years ago, and then more recent progress, precisely how you can interpret this wave function coefficient. And in the limit in which you take the norm of all external fields, the sum of their norms to zero, we call that the total. Well, they call it the total energy. So you go there is always a pole of this um, wave function coefficient. They have a pole in KT, and the residue of that pole is the amplitude. And there is a very precise formula that can be written that we worked out last year with coefficients and all that says that there is a pole, which is one over KT. There are some overall factors that come from normalization, some numerical normalization in front. And here, eventually you find if this is a correlator, the real part of the amplitude. And if this is a wave function coefficient, just the full amplitude itself. So this is the connection to flat space physics, which has to do with the fact that in the infinite past, the per perturbations were much shorter and so effectively lived in Minkowski space. Uh, and from this, the order of the pole is also an extremely simple uh, uh, formula, which is one plus the sum over all vertices involved of their mass dimension minus four. So this tells you how severe this uh, divergence will be. And uh, the, an expansion in one over KT to some power is the equivalent of an effective field theory expansions of this object. The higher, the more derivative you have, higher dimension operators, the more severe this pole becomes. And that's how you probe uh, uh, the, the UV completion of the theory until the EFT breaks down. So you have five minutes. Yeah, great. I haven't even talked about unitarity. So unitarity, you guys know better than me, U, U dagger equals one is the conservation of probability. Uh, what would be very interesting to know is how unitary, unitary time evolution in the bulk of the system is encoded on the spatial uh, boundary. And this is more complicated than, than, than you would think because time completely disappears in the boundary description. So it's not clear what unitary time evolution means since there is no time evolution in the boundary. And um, also notice that time evolution is not a symmetry. So just having uh, a unitary representation of the symmetries of the problem is a priori not sufficient to ensure that time evolution, which is not a symmetry, is unitary encoded. Uh, but we made some progress in perturbation theory to find the consequences of unitary time evolution in the bulk. And we came up with this basic idea. And what it does, it is it constrains the analytic structure of wave function coefficient. If you write wave function coefficient as a function of the external momenta, their vectors and their norms, and you separate out the norm from the, the direction of the vector. Uh, when you um, analytically continue the norms to minus themselves in the lower complex uh, half plane uh, and do a star, this thing has to is completely fixed by unitarity. For contact diagrams like this, this particular combination has to vanish. So we give it a name, we call it the discontinuity of psi down here. So for simple contact diagram, this discontinuity has to vanish. For more general diagrams, 
that are not just contact, they have various interactions. The discontinuity is always fixed in terms of the discontinuities of simpler diagrams where you have cut internal lines. So the discontinuity of a four point function is fixed by the discontinuity of two three point functions. And what we proved uh, earlier this year was that this is valid to all order in perturbation theory for particles of any mass, any spin, and arbitrary local interactions, as long as you assume a bunch Davis vacuum. That's the crucial assumption. Uh, so this is valid to any number of loops. It's valid for gravity, et cetera. And the general rule is that you have to sum the discontinuity of, of a graph is equal to the discontinuity of the sum of all possible cuts of internal lines, single cut, double cut, triple cut, and so on. Uh, so this is the, the Sitter equivalent of cosmological cutting rules. And it should be a constraint and is a, a powerful constraint on the boundary uh, observable. So you can predict many properties of the result just from this. For example, we show this how uh, we show how using this you can uh, almost completely fix the one loop corrections to the two point functions, which then leads to one loop correction to the power spectrum. And we re recover some previously computed coefficient, but we extended it. To, to, to other general theories. I don't have the time to, 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 to describe this result, but the, the, the statement is that when you understand unitarity, you can constrain loops from three level objects because their cuts are, are fixed. So I have a quick question. I know you're running out of time. Uh, I, is this, uh, I mean, is, is that a general Hilbert space kind of proof of this or is this just a perturbative argument by looking at the structure of perturbation theory? I mean, how, could you just indicate how the, the argument follows? Yes, I would, um, it's a structure of perturbation theory. So it's fully perturbative. Uh, my main goal is trying to understand how this can have a deeper uh, meaning in terms of the Hilbert space. Uh, but I'm struggling to understand precisely what is the equivalent of time translations on the boundary where time translations disappear. They are not linear combination of the, of the CFT generators because those are symmetries and this is not the symmetry. Uh, so that's something that I would like to understand better. I can tell you how later how we are trying to understand it. But at the moment, it's just a statement order by order in perturbation theory. And the way it works is to notice that uh, back to boundary propagator obey a simple equation, which says um, k star is equal k of minus k, some really simple thing, that in ADS, uh, it, it's almost there, that property. But because in, in ADS, the the radial direction is real, you cannot take a star to change its value. While well, in the city that becomes i tau, where tau is conformal time, so with a star you can put a minus, and that minus is um, compensated by a minus in the analytic continuation of energy, that's the trick. And this simple property about uh, the bulk to boundary extends to the bulk to bulk propagator, and when you have that property, you can uh, see how that bulk to bulk propagator gives you um, it gives you delta function when you apply this discontinuity, which eventually cuts it down. So I can maybe write an equation, which would be simple. Yeah, no, just, just one more thing. I mean, the details I, I, I can try and see. But uh, so you said it applies to the bunch Davis vacuum. But if there is some result that applies to all correlators, you can always act on the left and the right with the right operator and change the vacuum, right? So I'm confused about why some uh, very general result would apply only to a specific vacuum. I mean, as long as you have, if you go perturbative away from the bunch Davis vacuum, I think it's okay. If you have a, like a single A, a dagger perturbations, but if you go to an alpha vacuum of general, which has the non perturbatively related, uh, yes. then it would not obey. And in fact, uh, you can compute even the two point function from alpha vacuum for particles of general mass. And if the mass is not zero or conformally coupled, this thing will, will fail. Um, so when you go too far away from that vacuum non perturbatively then it breaks down. Okay, thank you, thank you. Excellent question. So the main trick is just, when you have this equation, then everything else follows. Um, in perturbation can you, can, you, can, you, can you wind up maybe a couple of minutes? Yes. Uh, so I want to show you how these bootstrap rules can, we can already start using them to learn about three level things. And hopefully in the future, one will be able to, to learn about more complicated object. Uh, and here, I just wanted to show you that the structure of the, the simplest interacting object, which is the three 
uh, the cubic wave function is completely fixed. The, the, for massless scalars uh, in the city, this has to be um, a rational function. The, all the poles are fixed by this choice of the bunch of Davis vacuum. Um, then the numerator is a polynomial whose order is fixed by scale invariance uh, and whose variables are fixed by both symmetry. And then solving the problem is just a simple uh, algebraic uh, question of what polynomials are allowed. And because of locality, we know that the derivative of this has to vanish. So you write down the most generic polynomial with free coefficients and all possible variables to all possible orders. And then you, you demand that it is manifestly local and that fixes all of these coefficients. And by this very simple, you know, a high school student could do this, this calculation, uh, you find exactly all the results that we know and love in the literature, but infinitely many more. For example, the zero order solution of this gives you exactly local non-Gaussianity, as well as the non-Gaussianity that comes from five cube interactions, which has a log. If you solve this to the next non-trivial order where there is a KT pole, then you find uh, equilateral non-Gaussianity from the effective field theory of inflation and orthogonal non-Gaussianity from the next order in the effective field theory of inflation. But of course, you can go to all infinite orders in derivatives, and we have written down a closed form expression for this. So the calculation is much simpler. You don't have to do integrals. You don't have to write a Lagrangian. These are just the most generic uh, three-point wave functions that are compatible with locality and unitarity. Um, most recently, we showed how this very interesting, it applies to uh, non-Gaussianities of graviton too. And there was a surprise, well, for me at least, it was a big surprise. So in principle, as Joao discussed, if you want to constrain higher derivative corrections to gravity, you write Lagrange and you can write down infinitely many terms with more and more Riemanns contracted with more and more ways. And for the simplicity of this argument, let me only consider parity odd things that are contracted using precisely one epsilon tensor. So you would imagine that there are infinitely many of these terms and therefore infinitely many three-point functions of gravitons that break parity with more and more derivatives. Instead, we proved that if you, instead of the wave function, you only look at the correlator, which is the physical observable, there are only three possible uh, uh, shapes that are consistent with unitarities. All others are, must be non-unitary. So infinitely many terms in the Lagrangian actually give you only three shapes of graviton three-point functions to all orders in derivatives at three level. This is an extremely powerful example and it explains why for the past five years, people in the literature kept computing things with higher derivatives like Charles Simons and kept finding zero or one of these three shapes. Uh, and I wish I had the time to show, to, to show you the proof, but I'm already out of time, but the proof is simple. You write down everything that is allowed by the symmetry and all of pretty much everything violates unitarity as given by this optical theorem. You just apply it and you say that these don't violate the optical theorem, except for things that have no poles. And those are just simple cubic order polynomial and there are only three of them. Uh, it would be great to connect this to some recent study by, uh, by Sachin, Jane and, and other people about parity breaking uh, uh, tensor correlators on the CFT side. Um, this is very general and, and extremely powerful and can be extended also to mixed correlator with scalars and tensor, but I'll skip that. Finally, kind of closing my, my seminar, sorry that I went long, but I did have many questions. Uh, I wanted to mention that this can be done also for uh, general diagrams that have any kind of exchange. Um, and you can develop a similar strategy to the recursion relation in flat space. And in this context, they are called partial energy recursion relations. Basically, you notice that the singularity of a most general three-level diagram are completely fixed by unitarity. The singularities can only be in partial energies, which are the energies that goes out of a sub-diagram. And all of those residues are fixed by unitarity. And once you have all the residues and all the singularities, almost the whole function is fixed up to boundary contributions. Um, and so uh, this really becomes a calculational tools that go to, to, to all orders in perturbation theory. Okay, I'll come to, to a summary, sorry for uh, going over time. So in the last few years, we have seen uh, a lot of progress building up on really 
uh, you know, seminal papers, some of which by, by Suvrat and Sandip uh, 10 years ago, but we have, we have seen how those calculation present some general features and general properties such as unitarity and locality. And once you have those, that's kind of your, your gateway to, to start uh, uh, applying a more of a bootstrap approach like the one that Joao described in the previous talk. And it's nice to see how fundamental principles are encoded and we can hope to do much better in the future. Uh, so my, my dream here would be to have really the sitter positivity bounds. We already know that the consistent theory in the sitter are not the same as in Minkowski. Uh, in Minkowski, you can have super gravity in the sitter, it has to be broken. So it's not clear that you can have a, a consistent in theory of self-interacting spin three half, massless spin three half in the sitter. So there should be different rules. What are those rules? Hopefully they come out from something like that. Um, you could try to do something more, uh, more non-perturbative, but I think it's still early days where you could do something more numeric and, and Joao had a nice paper earlier this year about this. So I'll, I'll stop here and, uh, and leave some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrico, for a very interesting talk. Uh, before we go to questions, uh, um, I was, I've been told to make an announcement that the next session is going to start at 4.30 p.m. So uh, uh, since uh, we can have questions till then, let's continue discussing till then. Uh, if anybody wants to hang around. So Shomdatto, you, your hand is raised. Yeah, so you had that operator del del kc in front of the wave functions, which, uh, which was being disputed a little earlier. So I was just wondering uh, if you have, when you go to the position space basis, uh, in general, you would have the e to the ik dot x minus x prime sort of thing along with the shy case, right? I'm sorry, just so are we talking about now uh, the locality thing or the... Yeah, yeah, the Is locality that... thing, yeah. Yeah, this one. Ah, okay. So if you, if you go to the position space basis, uh, yes. Then I would guess that in general you would have some Fourier coefficient like e to the i k dot x in along with the shy case shy ends right? Yes. In general. Yeah. So if you now uh, if you if you can you can now do an integration by parts to convert the del del k c to act on the e to the i k dot x minus x prime to bring down the x minus x prime. So in the position space basis, the analogous thing would be some x minus x prime times the position space wave function equal to zero, right? Is that correct? Yeah, somehow it's, it's the general rule that uh, the Taylor expansion of a function around the origin tells you about how the Fourier transform goes to zero at spatial infinity. So the fact that this has, is analytic and has vanished first derivative in, at k equals zero, means that the Fourier transform as a function of r, the distance, has to go to zero appropriately fast and appropriately for the massless function we're considering here means faster than one over distance to the sixth power, for example. So that, that's correct. So what you're saying is, so I'm saying that dk of psi of k equals zero, it implies that when you Fourier transform it, it gives you a power of x, for any pair of fields, any pair of points in Fourier space that are uh, separated, and this has to go like one over distance to the sixth power. Six comes because I'm considering fields uh, with dimension three, so two times three is six. Uh, but it, this hopefully can be extended to fields of different dimensions, but, but for massless fields, uh, their corresponding conformal dimension is three, so they have to go to zero like r to the six. So that's that's precisely what what this this condition implies and you can do some Fourier transform uh, as, as you're suggesting do you have yeah R? okay do you have R? please unmute yeah uh hi uh thanks for the great talk um i had a quick question about your unitarity relation um if if we were working in global visitor space rather than at the Poincare patch you could Turn on sort of uh, fluctuations both in the infinite past as well as the infinite future. And then, uh, uh, so you could send stuff from the infinite past into the infinite future. So that that, that object would be very much like a, a genuine X matrix. You prepare stuff in the past and you measure it in the future. And presumably that object would obey some uh, 
version of S dagger S is equal to zero. Uh, I was wondering whether what the connection between the unitarity of that object and the unitarity that your finding is. Uh, well, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, excellent question. I think it would be the same, the same unitarity. Um, and perhaps it's our, our fault why we didn't do it that way. We, we could have tried. So we have two derivations of this, this relation. The first one really starts from UU dagger in interaction picture perturbation theory, and we just follow that UU dagger. The main difficult, so, so that would be very similar to what you're saying is that I should take global coordinates and evolve in the whole of the system. The main difficulty is that when you try to play the same game that you play for amplitude, you get a term which is, uh, you know, delta u plus uh, delta u dagger is equal to some kind of delta u delta u dagger thing, and here you insert uh, a resolution of the identity schematically. Uh, for amplitude, this delta u dagger thing you just interpret it as an amplitude where it, initial and final particles are reversed. But for, the, for this case, we didn't have that interpretation for the, for the Poincaré patch. And so that's where that analytic continuation came in. And that was a trick to rewrite this term. But perhaps if we were to do it for the global decider, then this would have a more natural interpretation. That's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Deepan. Yes, sir. Am, 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 I, am I audible? Yes. How does the decider background affect the page curve and also the decider united and also the decider unitarity? How does it affect the page curve and the black hole information problem? Yeah, good question. I have been trying to myself to, to learn. I had a dream that if we understand the unitarity constraint beyond perturbation theory, maybe as a, as a boundary CFP statement, uh, that might tell us when perturbation theory violates this bound. We do expect that the final, the finite entropy of uh, the sitter space, or rather of a, the sitter static patch, is in contradiction with perturbation theory because in perturbation theory you have infinitely many degrees of freedom. Um, and so at some point perturbation theory is making a mistake and there should be a correlation uh, among all of the possible gravitons and scalar fields that, that you find in, in, in perturbative quantization. Uh, so my hope is that maybe translating some of these bounds to, um, to the static patch, you would see that at some point these, these unitarity bounds are violated and like for the page curve that would tell you here, you should have some non-perturbative effect. At the moment, this is more aspirational than, than practical, but that's uh, an excellent direction in which to, to try to think. Okay, Sand Sandeep. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Enrico. Thanks for a really beautiful talk and the results are really impressive. Uh, I just wanted to understand, uh, didn't understand some of the things you said. If you just go to the bispectrum again in your slides, is, did I understand right that just imposing your notion of locality and unitarity, I meant the, yeah, the bispectrum, you, you can at most have only say these three or four fun functions which are allowed? Is, is that- No, the, no, sorry. No, I no, no they, yeah. they don't pull orders. Eh? So, so I haven't written them, but they, this was just the solution. So. So this is the equation that I'm solving, and I have to tell you what is the power, how many derivatives I'm working with, which is uh -huh. the number of derivatives in the EFT expansion tells me how severe this total energy pole is. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. larger P means a bigger polynomial here. Yeah, I see. Capture for more derivatives, and then I have more and more solutions. And these are the solution in the next page for P equals zero, one, two, and three. But yeah. then you can solve for p equals four, five, six, and we have presented the solution to all orders, and those precisely match the infinitely many bispectra that you get if you were to do the calculation explicitly. I see. This I is see. True, true for scalar. For graviton parity odd, there is the very surprising feature that correlators actually there are only three, but that's a different one. For scalar, I there see. are infinitely. They're infinite. I see. And in the scalar case, if you organize them in terms of 
the breaking of scale invariance, uh, is there a sense in which at leading order uh, in a model independent way, there are only a few functions which can appear or? or these are no? all exactly scale invariant, all of these. These are all, so there's an infinite number, I guess. Huh? Even yeah, though. exactly. I see. So a lot these of are all exactly scale invariant, but only two of them are special conformal invariant, while all the others are not. In fact, only something like this is special conformal invariant. I see, but, but then a little, so maybe I'm a little confused. I mean, uh, in the standard slow roll inflation, the bispectrum originates due to the breaking of, in a sense, scale invariance, right? There's one factor of phi dot that suppresses the magnitude of the non-Gaussianity, as you said. That, uh, no, well, not really in the sense it is true that there is a phi dot, but there is also one over CS square in a equilateral or, or orthogonal. And because of that combination, you can make it as large as you want. So there are two, two, uh, two, two non-Gaussianity, the local one, and I agree that's always in single fit, always suppressed by yeah, or their epsilon or theta, which are slow roll. True, true. Yeah, and the equilateral non Gaussianity, because that is the factor of one over the speed of sound, uh -huh. even if you respect dilations, but you, you, you break a lot boost because you have um, That's true. Uh, a sound cone that is very different from the light cone. Yeah. Because it makes CS yes, uh, much smaller than C, then, um, then non Gaussianity becomes huge even in the limit in which dilations are unbroken. And that's what I was trying to say, that there's really two different order parameters. Yeah. It has to do with the fact that, uh, well, if you have boundary non-unitary CFTs, you actually can have scale without conformal invariant. The two things are not bound together, yeah. which is probably related to the fact that the boundary theory doesn't have to be unitary in the Lorentzian sense. Yeah, I see. So you say that these all preserve scale invariance. Um, exactly scale invariant, yeah. Exact scale invariant, I see. Okay. Thank Nevertheless, you. boost by an arbitrary amount, which is kind yeah. of why I think it's so interesting yeah. that there is a lot that is scale invariant, but not boost invariant. Right. And that's probably what we most likely will be able to see in the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. Maybe 100 years from now, we yeah. also see that the smaller one, which is low roll suppressed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, you have been, yeah. Yeah, thank you for your talk. So um, uh, I had a question about, uh, uh, you had a slide on uh, Feynman diagrams where you you mentioned the point that uh, in, in digital, even for tree level diagrams, you have to compute um, these conformal time integrals because there's no conservation of energy. So um, I was just wondering, uh, hey, is it possible that there is some representation of uh, correlation functions, which won't be the position or the momentum space representation, of course, in which uh, one can just get the tree level digital correlator to be a, uh, just a product of uh, the, the, the propagators and vertex factors. So the, the reason I'm asking is that, for example, in, in ADS, we know that uh, one can, again, at tree level, write the correlator in Mellon space. There are Feynman rules at, at tree level and uh, some things have been done at loop level also. And of course, in flat space QFT, we do this in momentum space. So is it a reasonable uh, expectation or not that there is some representation that in which you have something similar for, for d -sitter? That will help also uh, perhaps if there is such a thing for, for doing loop calculations. If, if d -sitter tree level correlators can be. Ah, I see. Yeah, it's an excellent question. So there are uh, uh, Massimo Tarona and Charlotte Slade have developed this uh, this approach to translate uh, the, the Melling space uh, uh, representation in ADS to the sitter. And indeed, there things get more algebraic, exactly as, as you are suggesting. The, the main complication there is that there are some phases that you have to work out, which has to do with the fact that the notion of unitarity in the sitter is different from the Lorentzian unitarity in ADS. But you're exactly right that uh, for things that are fully the sitter, Invariant and Mellon space is, is the way to go. And there things simplify a lot. As we were discussing before with Sandeep, there are things that if you really insist that everything is the sitter invariant, 
there is nothing you can measure the, of the thing of the correlators we care about. You can measure some scalar fields, but the curvature perturbations cannot have non-trivial correlators because of the theorem I wrote before. So here I want to consider interactions, these Fs that are actually violate uh, the Sitter isometries. And then for those, the smelling space representation cannot be used, meaning it would get extremely complicated. Just like Fourier space for something that doesn't preserve translations. And so for this, I had to do something else. Recently, we showed that this problem of having integrals can actually be resolved because there is a complete solution in Minkowski. For the wave function in Minkowski, all of these integrals can be done. And then we show that you can uplift it from Minkowski using derivative operators. So we propose a differential representation recently, which is valid also for things that break the Sitter isometries and so cannot be represented in Mellin space. So I think you can choose. If you want to have the Sitter isometries, you stay here on the left and go for melding space. If you want to break this special conformal transformation, then you can use what we recently proposed. So I would say that that's how I would think about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, last question, Sachin. Uh, so, uh... No, uh, this is related to what Siraj was asking. Um, so if I take the, let's say, flex phase limit, the the unitarity, notion of unitarity that you have, that will reduce to the flat space amplitude unitarity, right? Excellent, exactly. That's how we originally derived it. We went, we, we knew that there was an optical theorem on the, on the residue of that pole because that's the amplitude. And then we said, how come that the, the wave function knows about this optical theorem and we were able to extend it away from that pole to, to the full wave functions. That's exactly as you said. Yeah. I see. And uh, the, uh, can you go to the parity or you said you just, you got three, uh, three solutions, right? For the correlator, yes. Uh, I'm just curious that, you know, uh, the, uh, from CFT perspective, maybe one can derive it, but even before that, uh, uh, there is always a one to one correspondence with this correlated to the flat phase amplitude, right? So, uh, from the flat phase amplitude perspective, would you have been able to get to the same, same, same conclusion that there, there would be just three, uh, three possibilities? Exactly. Yeah, precisely. Excellent question. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. So, clearly, the, the, main, the main theme here is that correlators are some real things, while wave functions. Uh, and amplitudes are some complex things. So the, and the relation is that the correlator is the real part of the amplitude schematically because of that equation that I wrote before. There is some factor of i. Um, and so if you were to compute the flat space amplitude for this parity odd graviton three point function, you will see that they all have precisely the right number of i um, that only three of them survive and all those with higher and higher dimension, they have the wrong eyes and they will be purely imaginary and therefore they will not contribute to the correlator. Yes, so you, you can do the way you are suggesting. And there it would be just a matter of counting eyes. And you will see that the eyes for all but three of them, the eyes in this formula will give you zero. Right. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so let's let's thank uh, Enrico uh, again uh, and also Joao for a very uh, productive session. Uh, so the next session is going to start now. I'll hand it over to uh, Alok Mistra. Thank you, Nandya. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, so is Shivaji there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh... Okay. So, um, yeah, please uh, take over. I mean, we start right away. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, welcome to the last session of this, <clears throat> of talks of this, this conference. So, in this session, there will be three talks of 30 minutes duration each. So, the first talk is by Ronak Soni from Cambridge University. And the title of his talk is from Bekenstein Hawking to Gibbon Hawking via Hawking page. Uh, thank you. Uh, well. okay, so I will uh, remind you, Ronak, around 25 minutes.